on your screen, you can see Mike Hoseas and Jim, and this is the fireside chat with both of them. And I believe we are kind of slowing down here. So Jim and Mike, if you're ready, over to you. Okay, thank you, Skylar. And welcome everyone to this fireside chat with Mike Hoseas. And um, Mike, thank you for being here and joining us. Looking forward to the discussion. You and I haven't, haven't talked in a little while, so I'm actually looking forward to this just to, just to have a conversation. But the, the title of the, of the webinar is How to Create Culture of People Who Are Both Willing and Able to identify and solve problems. So actually, even with that, from that initial question, and actually before I jump into that, if anybody watching has questions, please put it into the into the chat and uh, we'll try to watch that and uh, and ask your questions as well. But from that title, some, some questions I have looking at this is, can you describe kind of like the, the, from the both willing and able to identify and solve problems? Can you explain the willing to identify? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? What does that look like? Uh, thanks for having me, Jim, and, and thank you all for joining uh, the webinar. The, the fireside chat here in June, I'm questioning the title, but uh, it's as hot as it's been. <laughs> but uh, I want to, before I do that, I want to let people know my background if they don't already. Maybe you already sent that out, but, you know, I had good fortune to grow up with Toyota in Kentucky at the first wholly owned plant anywhere outside of Japan uh, by Toyota. So, so I had a unique experience that we had 400 Japanese that were teaching us the, the Toyota production system and how to think and lead the Toyota way. And, uh, you know, I had a, I had a, also opportunity to be a supervisor uh, and have a, a, a Japanese coach, a manager, and an executive uh, in my 13 years there at Toyota. I also had a few years in, in human resources. So, so I learned firsthand so that, you know, the experience, the experience I had is what I'm sharing with you uh, from what I taught that uh, was taught by the Japanese because it wasn't the way I normally thought about things. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples here in a quick amount of time we have today. And the willing and able. So, you know, and when I wrote the book Toyota Culture, so I also wrote that with Jeffrey Liker back in 2007. Uh, it was fortunate enough to win the Shingo Prize and there's, and it took me around the world, also meeting lots and lots of different companies, countries, industries that are all on this lean journey or this OPEX or CI or whatever we want to call it, right? Trying to get better. And uh, so, so I told Jim earlier, you know, that title, I could talk eight hours and I do talk eight hours and sometimes three days events on, on answering Jim's question here uh, because the Toyota production system is a problem identification and a problem solving system. Uh, now, when I first went to work there, the Japanese separated problem ID from problem solving. And I didn't understand that at first. I thought it was the same thing. And I learned it's, it's really two different things. And um, and we we go, we were gonna talk about the Kentucky tour, but I'll mention it now because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we have a Kentucky tour or three day event going in October. And we'll go to Toyota, we'll take a tour, and we'll have a few hours with TSSC, which is Toyota's uh, training department. And, and they, they've, uh, they've defined TPS here recently, and, and, and they quoted for the group, and I'm going to quote it for you now because I really love it. Uh, it's basically, TPS is a culture of highly engaged people that are identifying and solving problems to drive performance improvement. And, and so... So that, again, that's a mouthful, but people that are identifying and solving problems that are driving performance improvement. And so if we can get people doing that, and, and the other thing about TPS, it's like, who's, whose job is that? Is that just the, the CI people or the managers or the engineers? No, of course, it's everybody's job. And so, so that's the first kind of key point in, in my answer to your question is that we have to make an intentional culture and we have to make it. So our intentional culture means we're, we're stating the desired behaviors. So Shingo defines the culture as the, the behaviors of your people. And if the, if we don't have a desired behaviors defined, then you don't have any intentional culture, right? You just have what's happening and leaders come and go, you know, I was asked that at a conference one time is Toyota's culture intentional or accidental. 
And of course, the answer was it's intentional. And I hope yours is. And if your current one isn't, then you need to make it intentional. And so I, I usually sum up Toyota's culture in just that. It's people who are identifying and solving problems. And then leaders who are coaching and teaching people to do the same, right? So, so I, I go to a lot of gimbal walks and I see a lot of firefighting, workarounds, band-aids. So, so the first thing we got to do, Jim, is state that we want people to solve problems. Like it's everybody's job to solve problems. Even if you look at Numi and, you know, Toyota's partnership with General Motors, that was a a big difference with this UAW contract. They said, it's not just your job to do your job in the TPS. It's your job to do your job, of course, but then it's your job to improve your job. So, so the first thing you gotta do is to, to put the willing and able is to make it part of the role, is to make it the standard. Because as the Japanese would say, no standard, no problem. Okay. So when I, and, I, and I, I haven't met a leader yet who has disagreed when I asked, well, how many people do you want solving problems? Everybody. How often? Every day. Well, is that your standard? That's when it goes silent, right? <laughs> yeah. No, that's not our current expectation. I, I'm, I'm assuming from the Toyota, Toyota perspective, they they have so they want people willing to do it. People will be willing to do it. Say they come on board with that. I'm assuming from there they got to be the able. There's got to be some enabling mechanism, skills, methods, yeah. infrastructure to, to accomplish that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, so yeah. So in the in the logical sequence. So first we have to say, okay, it's everybody's job to identify and solve problems. And then to your point, you know, and that's part of the HR systems. We were hiring people who were in agreement with those standards, right? Yeah. That that were, were willing to to do that. But then also to your point that when they come into the culture, what are those enablers? And um, and that's really the the and on. And I just did a webinar with Mark Graven here. He's got a great book out, the, the mistakes that make us. And um, and he talks about you know the story I always tell with when I scratched the car when they had me online in Japan, and then um, and I didn't want to I didn't want to identify that problem. So right, so that's as somebody willing. So that's the psychological safety part of it. That hey. The TPS tools are put in to bring the problems to the surface. But if us, if the culture is such that we're scared to bring those problems to the surface, then the problems won't get identified. And so, so that's like you said, those enablers where the, the leaders are not just encouraging people to identify problems and admit mistakes, but also themselves, right? <laughs> So when the leader themselves are admitting their own mistakes or identifying their own problems, that's what makes it safe for their people to do the same. Is, is part of that, Mike, is part of the an, an, an expectation, an expectation, my people will make mistakes, an expectation, I will make mistakes, and yeah. then the overarching expectation of, but that's okay. Exactly. You know, and and that's what, that's what I said the other day. It's like, it was so freeing, that culture, because... Because again, in other cultures I've been in, you spend so much time and effort putting up the defenses or the smoke screen or or pointing this direction, you know, they're saying, where's the problem? And and then with, to have that free of that allowed to time to be spent on solving the problem. So it was really, you know, you hear about that. It's not person, it's the problem. And, and it's, it's not the problem, it's the process. Or it's not the person, it's the process and all that. But when you can really do that, it is so impactful and effective. So do they have specific things that they train people to, the managers, supervisors, the operators that they train to be able to, to accomplish yeah. that? That's good. Well, you know, it's built into the system. So so the other thing I learned with, uh, you know, Shingo on how to voice is, you know, again, the culture is defined as the behaviors of our people. They also make the assertion, which one of my trainers did as well, that the behaviors of your people or the capability of your people do, will determine your business results. And I thought that was a, a big statement as well. Uh, and then the other thing that Shingo talks about is that, again, you have to have your desired behavior. So let's say that's problem identification, problem solving. And then you have your current behaviors as your culture. Well, if your current behaviors aren't that, then you have to change the systems 
or start new systems to get the behaviors that you're wanting. So I hope the audience is hearing that because it's really empowering. So we, we were taught at Toyota to work on the system, to not just not be part of the system or working in the system. And so that you got your technical systems, your, your work systems, your people systems, like the, we just said, the hiring system. So, so the and on was my point there on the work system. So that and on is put in there as a, a tool for people to identify problems, right? But if you've got a culture of leaders who are top down and, you know, heads are going to roll and, you know, don't want people to pull it. So that's, that's why you said your point is. So we got the tool and now they train you, trained me, that when somebody pulls the and on, you don't shake your head and say, oh, geez, what now type of thing. You Thank you, Jim, for pulling the and on. You know, I was always talking to the new hires and like, how many times a day do you think that and on is pulled? We've got an assembly plant out there, 500 people day shift, 500 people night shift, take a guess. And they'd say 100, 200, and I'm like, too low, too low, 1,000. Th I'm like, no, try 12,000. 12,000 and on pulls in an assembly plant with 1,000 people every day. Now, that was a lot of years ago. We had more problems. But then since the Kaizen continuous improvement, I called back for the book, you know, in 2008, I think. And it was, you know, half of that. It was 6,000. Now, it's it's still a couple, you know, two, 3,000. So, again, and I would say to people and leaders, is that okay or no good? And, of course, to the topic of our <laughs> discussion, a title, it's exactly what we want. People identifying problems and solving problems. So, if I say, thank you, Jim. Then the next time you have a problem, what are you going to do? You're going to pull it. If I say, now what, Jim? Geesh, you again? You're not yeah. going to pull it next time. Yes, but yeah, the po positive reinforcement for that versus negative yeah. reinforcement is a big factor to the big success factor. of it. Yep, yep. Because that's why I tell people, you know, you can put up all the andons and the bells and the whistles and the buttons, but if you're not, if you don't have that, those enabling behaviors, like you said, then people won't pull it. You know, I had another guy, a plant in Canada, the guy just told them to raise their hand. And then they were there to support them. So people were raising their hand. So, so again, that's how you get people willing to identify problems is by the leadership behavior. So let me ask this, at least from, from the line standpoint, and you say, you know, 12,000. So I guess, you know, originally 12,000 in a day, right? Yeah. So that'd be approximately 6,000 a shift. 500 people. So I'm assuming that's, you know, everybody's pulling not all the time, but fairly frequently. So is there, is there some other part of the system in order for, because that's, I suppose, uh, 6,000 a shift of responses that right. need to happen. How, how do they, do they get overwhelmed by that? How do they take care of that? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, you take care of that in two ways. One is with the true North kind of, again, like we said, the culture, the intentional culture, and the intentional culture of Toyota was quality wins, quality wins over productivity. Of course, safety is first, then quality wins over productivity. So that's a tension with every manufacturing organization. And so that and on was the, the tiebreaker is like, boom. So, so the, you know, when, again, it's better now, but when we had those 12,000 polls, you know, we might be down 15, 20% of the day when we have an 80% run ratio. Uh, but that was okay because the quality was hitting standard. So, so again, that's that's part of the culture. Because if it's not where it's you got to get them out the door, then people also aren't pulling the end on to, to make sure we hit the number. But then the quality suffers. So at Toyota, the productivity suffered, the quality didn't. And if I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I'm assuming at some point in time they needed the, you know, whatever the time you're down needed to make improvements on less than that sure. amount of time sure. without compromising yeah. um, um, quality. the quality, yeah. but still needed to meet their whatever their output requirements are. So how did they deal with that? Well, we added overtime. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Daily. It was a daily, it was a daily call after lunch on that overtime again. So it wouldn't stress the system. And so people were still enabled to pull the and on and get the quality first, you know, so I mean, a, with, so with that, with two shifts, I'm assuming there was a gap between shifts in order to give that buffer exactly. zone yep. if you need to do overtime. Exactly. Exactly. And we would call the overtime a couple hours after lunch. So, so that's the way it worked. Now, now again, we got people identifying problems. And then to your point, now you got to start working on 
I'm solving them. Right. And, and again, the, you know, they've been, they've been way improved on the end on fulls now a couple from 12,000 to a couple thousand is a big improvement, obviously. And so now the quality is still there and then the productivity. So now they're running maybe a 97, 98% uptime instead of a, you know, 80, 85% uptime back when we had a lot of those and on pulls. So, so now the, the problem solving, let's get back to that. So the identification we've got, and, and I like your point. So what we, I, when we pull the end on, we now need people there to answer. And a lot of companies don't have that. And that's what that one company in Canada did when people were raising their hand, they were, the managers were there, the engineers were there, the CI team was there all to support that, right? Because if not, then they would quit raising their hand. Um, so, so that support is there. And then the next thing is then you got to start solving those problems, right? Yeah. And uh, so you know, it was all about prioritization. When you had 12,000, then you prioritize, right? Which one's going to go first? And you would prioritize safety, quality, et cetera. The other thing on the problem solving, again, is when you got so many problems, you got more problems than problem solvers. And that's why Toyota said everybody's a problem solver. And again, I rarely go into a company where that is philosophically or practically being done. And uh, and so that's where, you know, I had a I had a guy in one of my Kentucky things, like when I asked people, you know, what what their debrief or whatever their pluses and deltas, and he's like, I get it. It's like, I've got a thousand people back home. I, the light went on. Now, if I can get a, those thousand people to solve problems, like that's going to make it so much, my job so much easier. And that's going to have us get our results so much better. Yes. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. With, with that, it makes me think of, again, I'm assuming they're doing something different. Uh, organizations I've been in, uh, somebody in a leadership role, supervisory role, whatever, they may have 30, 40 people report to them. At some point, do they get overwhelmed because they've got, you know, 10 people at one time raising their hand, pulling the cord or all that, you know, I'm, how do they, yeah. how do they address, address that? You're, you're asking some really deep questions here and again, in a quick time. So yes, that's part of the system too. So we had a one to five ratio, uh, at Toyota. So five uh, team members for every team leader, four or five team leaders for every group leader, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up for that reason, because you got to be there to support the problem solving. Uh, and, and people, again, it, it's backwards to the thinking. It's like, how could we afford that? And it's like, Toyota is the most profitable car company on earth because of that. How can you not afford yeah, I not to do part. that? Yeah, how can you afford not to do that? Yeah, so again, it's that just how to twist and turn that thinking to get that. Uh, you know, again, I'm I'm working with a lot of companies right now, and and it's that it's that floor problem solving uh, that the team leaders and the group leaders are currently being firefighters and just keeping the line running. You know, and instead of like asking why, instead of keeping it from coming back. So let me get that point out there because. Because a lot of even people are on their hour by hour boards and stuff, and they write that, you know, we lost this amount of time and they give reasons. And it's like, is that what you want them to do? And the one the one company said, yes. I'm like, well, what are you doing with all those reasons? And they said, well, the engineers come around and they log them all. And then at the end of the month, they can make a Pareto. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And then how many problems are we getting solved? Well, the engineer will take the high one. We had these many hundreds and thousands of problems, literally. Yeah. And the only problem solver now is the engineer. What about all day long, all of your team leaders? So it's just like turning again the switch. Instead of the team leader writing up the reason, have the team leader write up the cause and the countermeasure, right to that, to that reason. And then the companies that are doing it like are amazed, They're like oh gosh, we didn't know they could do that. They were loading. I had one company say they were loading boxes a month ago. Now they're doing these this problem solving. I had no idea. But so untap that potential that you have. Mike, are there any particular skills that they teach or use to help help in the actual problem solving methodology or anything like that? Well, I mean, it's definitely plan, do, check, act, and uh, and so you there there you you do need some technical training, but most of it's common sense, to be quite honest with you. But but. You know, a, lo a little goes a long way on the plan to check act and ask why, you know, so 
So the first thing that the Japanese taught is, you know, if there's no standard, there's no problem, right? You need you need three things to have a problem. You need to have a standard, the current situation, and a gap. If you have those three things, you have a problem. So you do have to train people that. But again, that that's what I always say, simple, <laughs> you know, but not easy. Then you got to practice that. Uh, so people can practice that. Uh, just ask next time something comes up. And that's what the, the Japanese did with us. They were like, my son, you don't have problem. You have phenomenon. Uh, and, and I learned that that meant that I had stuff happening, but I didn't have a standard. So then I had to make a standard. And you make a standard. Now you, you get your, now it's not a phenomenon anymore. Now it's a problem because I had a standard. Now I can ask why. And now I can countermeasure that root cause, right? And so the countermeasure is countering the root cause so that it doesn't come back. So I'm going to tell again, we got a good group of people here. So when you're at your huddle meetings and you got the people start identifying these problems and the downtime and the defects and the scrap, just ask why a couple of times. Then they'll start coming back to you, but they won't come back to you with countermeasures. They'll come back to you with fixes and band-aids and, and workarounds. And then the question that I was asked by the Japanese, and I want you to ask is, will, they, this, will that action keep it from coming back? And 98 times out of 100 in my experience at the Gemba, the answer will be no. And then you can coach, right? But if we never ask the question, the person will never get coached and will never do any, will never think any differently. But as soon as you ask them, will that keep it from coming back? Now they'll start thinking differently. Okay, hopefully that answered. Um, Wayne actually asked a question. I think I think you answered it. Wayne, let, just let, respond again if that didn't answer the question that uh, you asked, because he asked that question as you started talking about that, and I think you might have answered to some degree um, with what he asked about how detailed is a problem solving, for example, problem ID and root cause analysis, and it sounds like yeah, you know, we always said we got you know basic basic root cause was I what I just went through with you. Now, for higher level problems, we have the, you know, the H step, the A3. Again, that'll be managers and engineers and things. And, and we'll even do quality circles and teach team members the H step problem solving. And that's a little bit more complex problems, cross-functional. And so definitely that'll be a, high, a next level of, of training and, and practice. But even then, you know, my, my H step problem solving at Toyota was like four hours, the training. So Toyota, we separated training from on-the-job development, right? So you had the training class, and then you went and practiced, and then you had the, the Japanese, or now us American coaches, then coaching that A3, or again, coaching that basic root cause at the huddle. So so the training is the easy part. The, the, what usually is missing is that development, on-the-job, daily development. Okay. Actually, somebody just asked, where can they, where can they go? Uh, Olga asks, where can she go to learn more about the eight-step problem-solving technique? You can go to Kentucky in October. We're going to get to that. <laughs> we'll actually go over it. We'll go over it. It won't take four hours. We'll just do about an hour of it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, literally, that's the uh, – and we'll give you uh, we'll give you A3 templates and things um, on how to do that. And I always say it, it's – again, it's the training is just the – the training is just learning the methodology and the terminology. Now we got to practice it. Now we got to do the kata. You know, I love the Mike Rother and the kata. Now we got to do the repetitions. And I like the, again, I like the kata. We have to do the improvement kata and the coaching kata because we just made that distinction, right? As leaders, you got to be problem solvers and you got to be coaches. And, and we talked about the huddle meetings I hope you're having. You know, we, at, at Toyota, we went to at least two huddle meetings a day. One where I was I was giving the problem to my coach and they were coaching me. And the other one where my folks are giving the problem to me and telling me what they're doing and I'm coaching them. So every day I'm coaching and I'm being coached. I had one trainer said, can you teach on this hand or learn on this hand and teach on that hand? And so that's what we want to do every day. So again, the, the eight step is just to start the on the job practice daily development. That's the key. Okay. And I actually put the link in the chat to the, the two Kentucky tour. If people want to go to the website and take a little more detail on that, but it sounds like at that you're, you're visiting several different facilities. You're having several different training sessions is mixed into that. I think a three day event. Yeah. We'll talk about it quick. Um, yeah, it's three days and it's 
three half days of, of this discussion and going over the H step and the A3, and then the uh, three half days of going to Gemba. So uh, the first Gemba is Toyota, actually. And then we meet with TSSC, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and that's a great tour. Uh, but it's also, so anyway, so then the, the other two days we go to, to area companies, uh, a lot of times Toyota suppliers, and we'll have a walking tour and we'll have more time to talk to the leaders and, and look at the boards and look at the, the hour by hour charts and look at the problem solving and stuff. So a lot more in depth and, and a lot more real. And, and so anyway, uh, last, just last time, uh, the April event, I had a guy at the end of the, the week say, I'm so glad we went to those other two places. He said, it was great to see Toyota. I thought it was really cool, but I also thought it was impossible. <laughs> and he said, but I went to these other two places and they were more like me and more like my plant and more like the issues I'm having. And now I know I can do this. And uh, I said, that's awesome. That's that's why we do these things. Yeah, actually, Steve, Steve actually can uh, comment a question um, kind of to go along with that is uh, uh, he says, I recently took over a plant that has zero problem solving, tons of band-aids and an old culture where people were not listened to. I've started with a simple escalation board for problems that the team members can escalate to. What else can I do to start changing this culture? I've greatly increased the communication as well. So what else What else can you do? Yeah, I love that. I, I've, I've seen that in couple, in fact, the one company we go to in Kentucky did, did just that after they went to the three-day event, they went back and started that board and, and then they took it from there. So so that, that board was a good start. Um, and then I'm, and I think you said that in there that then you engage them not just on the problem identification but in the solving of it as well, and and so that that's a really good thing. So, so in other words, you don't want to just to escalate or delegate up initially. You want to give the the work team an opportunity uh, and those team leaders an opportunity to solve to solve those problems because they do, you know Toyota or True North was the team members are the experts. And then the team leaders are, are the coaches of the experts. So they they know those work problems the best. That's why it's so critical that we get them to be solving the problem. So, so I'm good with the escalation. But again, I've been to companies where it was a delegation of problems up. And we want both. So we want to give them the opportunity. So Toyota would say solving problems identified and solved at the proper level and then escalated to the next. So as long as that board is, you're giving them a problem because then you can teach them just like we're talking about and, and and they won't know how to solve them at first, but then you'll be able to develop and teach them. And then like I had the one trainer said, you know, you're building your, your strong problem solving army and he would hold up his bicep. So you're, you're building that army of problem solvers. Um, but I love that you're, you're starting with problem identification. And then uh, again, now the team members won't have a whole lot of time during the day. So then you get those team leaders uh, and get them on doing some basic problem solving. Uh, and then that's your first layer. And then, like you said, have that escalation up to where then the engineers, the managers are now are getting the, those tougher ones. And then if you don't have a, if you don't have a standard, I encourage that an A3, an 8D, a DMAIC or an eight step like Toyota does or something to that effect with those more complicated problems. Okay, a couple more questions came in. I don't want to get to because we're getting real close to our target time. Uh, Courtney asked, did, you, did your teams collect the data or did did you just approach the problems as they occurred? Well, that's a really good question. That's that's a really good question. And, you know, it, we used to say at Toyota, like the Andon was the living Pareto. <laughs> and, and because... I mean, I remember even being at my group leader desk and I'd see the same light go on and on and then it go on again. And it's like the living parade. There it is. So now I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. Uh, so, and, and I remember I had one Japanese, like one of the, the head guys, like, you know, he didn't like any of the parade or any of the data, like just solve the problem. And, uh, but I've come to, uh, I, I come to answer that question as both, both and, uh, you know, again, What's usually missing is that first one real time, just go solve it. Um, so that's that's the one I would encourage you to work on. Uh, but what's also missing when we do our eight steps is, you know, is data. And um, so so you want that system there as well, because just like we talked to you with the last guy, you know, you you get that that first level with them putting it on the board and, and knocking out, but then they won't be able to knock out everything, the more complicated ones. So then 
you're getting the data then to escalate up, you know, to again to the engineer or to the, the manager. So so my answer to your question was both. And that'd be <laughs> awesome. If you can get both of those going, you'll be way ahead of where most people are right now. Okay. Well, good. Like I said, I knew the time would go by quick. One more question. I think this may be a good uh, closing question here is uh, um, uh, someone asked, uh, for someone who's just beginning, uh, and I might be able to initially answer this question, but I'll let you answer it as well, Mike. <laughs> um, for someone who is beginning, uh, where do you start learning these concepts? Is there any books you can recommend? Also, <laughs> what, what, uh, what are industry uh, sought courses industry courses one can take well certainly i can answer at least initially one you can answer too is i know one book is toyota culture by you <laughs> yeah. that's certainly one that uh has got a ton of learning around this uh the very very things people are asking about what you're talking about yeah 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 toyota way is a good book um you know lei's got several good books jim womack and things so there's there's a lot of literature out there um you know, I always tell, and we will end on this one. And again, I'll invite that person to Kentucky as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, the Japanese gave us, I tell people three things. And again, I was a supervisor, group leader to start. They gave us standard work. Now I could talk another half hour on standard work and I will in, in, in Kentucky. Like, like we've, we've got out there work instructions, engineering, technical instructions, and we want all those things. Re very rarely do I see true operator standard work. And that and that's there to, for improvement, and it's not, and we don't have it. So anyway, they gave us standard work, a scoreboard for safety, quality, productivity, costs, and HRD, and problem solving. So it was like, start with your current best practice, keep score to identify where you're having problems, and then start your problem solving. And then when we we do our problem solving, we get to root cause. We have learning. Guess what? We update the standard work. We revise the standard work and we retrain it and we do the cycle all over again. So, so that would be my recommendation. Those three things is going to be a good starting point for you. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, we're just a tiny bit past our target time. And I knew this would just, um, just go by really quick. Um, so everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Mike, thank you for uh, coming on and, and discussing this. Um, with us. It's always great to chat with you and we always learn a lot. Um, and with that, Skylar, I'll, I'll kind of hand it back off to you and you could kind of close this out. Awesome. Thank you, Mike and Jim. As a reminder, you will receive a link 24 to 48 hours from me to view the recording. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.